Good morning. Are we all here? Is everybody here? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, my name is Julie Roach. I am uh, one of the co-chairs of the Bill Morris Seminar. The other co-chair, Ernie, is with us in spirit, but he does have the flu. So I know. <laughs> so I'm flying solo today, but I want to start by introducing you to um, our president of the Association of Library Services for Children, Nina Lindsay, who is going to kick us off this morning before she heads off to all her many other things. Thank you, Julie, and thank all of you for uh, coming here today and for your work in preparing for your discussions. Um, you all know that the art of illustrating and writing children's books often goes underappreciated. We know how well a, a well-crafted book can spark an imagination or change a mind for a child, and how today it's crucial that all children have access to books that will help them become critical and creative thinkers. Our book awards set standards for the industry. They say that kids deserve books that are this good in all different kinds of ways. Our work in discussing books is one of constant discovery, and it's our jobs to listen to and question each other and ourselves as we explore these works. So I wanna thank you for bringing your curiosity as well as your passion today, and please have fun. So this is the 10-year anniversary of the very first Bill Morris Seminar, um, of which I was a participant. So it's pretty special to be up here today. It was one of the best experiences I ever had at an ALA conference. So you guys are in for a treat. Um, and Bill Morris was a pretty special person, and I have a pretty special person here to introduce him to you. Her name is Jenny Brown. Jenny Brown currently serves as the vice president and publisher of Albert Knopf Books for Young Readers, and she has over 25 years experience in the field. She started when she was five. Um, <laughs> she was a children's book editor for HarperCollins, which is where she met Bill Morris, and uh, she was children's reviews editor at Publishers Weekly for 10 years. She is the former children's editor of Shelf Awareness. She was director of the Center for Children's Literature at the Bank Street College of Education. She has a long resume, so, and she is a great friend. So I'm so happy she's here, and I'm so happy to introduce her so that she can share a little bit more with you about Mill Morris. It's such a pleasure to be with you all this morning and to talk about one of my very favorite people. Who was Bill Morris? At 21, I hadn't known what a mentor was. But that's what Bill became for me, from the moment I met him for as long as he lived. William C. Morris was born into a wealthy family in Eagle Pass, Texas, a town separated from Mexico by the Rio Grande. Raised by Mexican nannies, he spoke Spanish before he spoke English. He stood at about 5'2", but height was not a measure of this man. He became legendary in the children's books field, his generosity reached beyond the walls of first Harper and Brothers, then Harper and Rowe, and finally Harper Collins. If he detected in you an innate curiosity, intelligence, and passion, he would share all of his secrets with you. Whether you were a de debut author, a publishing colleague from another house, or a budding librarian. <clears throat> Librarians were his adopted family. Every morning he made two calls, one to Charlotte Salatow, the other to Jean Craighead George. And then he would call his favorite librarian friends to check out a rumor he'd heard and tell them about a terrific new book he was about to send. When I joined Harper in 1985, Bill was celebrating his 30th anniversary with the company and they threw him a party. Mama would have said this shows a lack of initiative, he said. But his loyalty was to the authors and artists and librarians provided his through line. They were his family. Bill started his career at Harper as a temp. Once he got to know you, he might tell you the story of how, as a temp, he'd read a submission for a book called Profiles in Courage by John F. Kennedy. He recommended they reject it. 
Thank God they didn't listen to me, he'd say. It was three times a bestseller. Once when he became a US senator, again when he was elected president, and a third time when he was assassinated. From temp, Bill moved to sales representative, calling on the buyers at Altman's department store, the Macy's of its day, and FAO Schwartz, the most famous toy store in the world, the one where Tom Hanks danced on a keyboard in Big. Ursula Nordstrom, the legendary editor who discovered and published such luminaries as Maurice Sendak and E.B. White, had a job opening for a library promotion manager. These two ladies, the buyers at Altman's and at FAO Schwartz, recommended Bill for the job. His finely honed instincts became a great asset to Harper. He could quickly surmise which authors and artists would make good presenters, and they relied on Bill to guide their careers. Even when authors followed an editor to other houses, they would still call Bill for his opinion. The same was true for young, talented librarians. If Bill sensed natural leadership qualities in someone he met at ALA, he'd bring him or her to the attention of the Al Scor Yalsa President and Nominating Committee. <clears throat> always in a gentle way, never forceful. Back at his desk, he would keep an eye out for a talented reviewer through regional or local reviews periodicals and immediately bring him or her to the attention of, in those days, Trev Jones at School Library Journal. In this way, he earned and kept the trust of those in leadership, quietly guiding careers and boosting the profiles of fledgling librarians. In 1992, Bill was given the very first AUS Distinguished Service Award. With characteristic humility, he accepted his award, saying, I was just doing my job. But he went so far above and beyond what most people do for work. And it was because he did what he did out of devotion to good books, good librarians, good educators, and for the children of America, as he liked to say. The last line of Eden Ross Lipson's beautiful obituary for Bill in the New York Times broke my heart. There are no immediate survivors until I came to realize it's not true. We are his immediate survivors, all of us in this room. When Bill died, he left a legacy to ask, and Katie Horning, who you're gonna hear from after me, formed a task force of Kate McClelland, Caroline Ward, and Tim Ditlow to help decide how best to use his gift. Together, they formed the Bill Morris Seminar. Julie Roach and Ernie Cox, who's with us in spirit, were members of its first graduating class, as Julie said. You are all part of this lineage, part of the great mentorship that Bill Morris modeled. It is our hope that you, in turn, will mentor the next generation of librarians. Together, we will keep his legacy alive. Have a great day. So, are you ready? Is everybody ready? <laughs> Katie, are you ready? Um, our, next, we will hear from our first keynote speaker, Katie Horning, who really needs no introduction, but she <laughs> is the director of the Cooperative Center for Children's Books at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, is we owe it to her that we're all here, <laughs> as you just heard. So. Um, um, Without further ado, I'm just going to welcome you, Katie. Come on up here and uh, tell them everything you know. <laughs> Is it okay if I just close this, Laura? Well, well, um, while we're waiting here, I, one of the, these photos of Bill are all so great, but the one I especially love is the one of him in his office with all the papers all strewn around. And Bill's office was legendary. I got to see it once. But um, he uh, told me whenever he was training a new assistant, he had to train them when they took a, a phone message to put the month, date, and year. <laughs> but he could find anything 
in that office. It was all, you know, the chronological dating, I guess, the piles. Um, but I'm really, so I'm really pleased to be speaking this morning at the Bill Morris Seminar for a number of reasons. First, I knew and loved Bill Morris, and Bill would have been so pleased to know that ALSC had established this seminar in his name um, in order to bring people together to talk about books. This seminar represents three things that Bill loved the most, books and librarians and talking. <laughs> Second, I'm th <clears throat> thrilled to be speaking to all of you. Congratulations to you for being here. It's a rigorous and competitive application process, and the fact that you are all here speaks to the fact that ALSC believes that each and every one of you will become active and vital members of this organization. Some of you I've gotten to know virtually through ALSC online classes that I teach in the Newberry, Caldecott, and Seibert. Others I've met at recent conferences, and the rest of you I look forward to getting to know throughout the day. And I look forward to seeing you all at future ALA conferences and institutes, ALSC institutes. <clears throat> As one of the old timers of ALSC, and um, some people call us battle axes, the battle axes of ALSC, which I take as a compliment, I can tell you how heartening it is for us to see the names of former Morris seminarians on ALSC committees and to see them planning the seminar as, as Julie and Ernie did. That's you know what this is all about. So thank you all for your commitment to ALSC. Lastly, I love to talk about book discussion almost as much as I love to discuss books. I can say honestly and without exaggeration that book discussion changed my life. And if you'll allow me to share one quick personal anecdote, I'd like to tell you how because it is pertinent to today's topic. Back in the late 1970s, I did say I was a battle axe, didn't I? I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, majoring in linguistics. Now, linguistics is a fascinating field, and I was totally caught up in studying the Andean language Quechua, and, and we had a class of five people, <laughs> and um, two instructors, one professor who had written the Quechua grammar and one native speaker. Um, so it was, it was a great class, and. Um, very, very interesting and um, challenging language to learn. And um, I was also interested in pursuing um, a study of the morphophonemic structure of modern Irish Gaelic. And fascinating stuff, trust me. You might have to take my word for it as a linguist. But as I reached the end of my junior year, I began to realize that, interesting as this all was, there was no practical application for linguistics as a field in the real world. There really is nothing you can do as a career with a degree in linguistics. And no one was gonna pay me to observe which characters on Welcome Back Cotter aspirated their W's and which ones didn't. So I decided that while I was at UW, I'd get a certificate in teaching English as a foreign language. Um, and this was a program that was offered through the English department, and it had just five courses you had to take, and it was also something that really interested me. Languages interested me, and I thought, well, then I can just travel around the world and always find a job teaching English. Um, so I thought it was perfect. So I signed up for it, and I started taking the courses, and I really enjoyed it. Um, one of the courses that was taught, that it was taking, was on the fourth floor of Helen C. White Hall, the building that housed the English Department and the School of Library and Information Studies, and actually it still does. And back then, the School of Library and Information Studies was just called Library School. One day, I arrived from my class uncharacteristically early, so I wandered down the hall and I walked into a tiny little angular room full of books. I suddenly felt very conspicuous because the room was so small and I felt like I didn't belong there. I knew I didn't belong there. Uh, there was a young woman sitting at the desk inside the door 
And she looked up at me when I walked past and asked me if she could help me. And I said, no, 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 I'm just um, looking around. Um, and I proceeded to look at this small book display over on a window seal. And it was a display of children's books. There were a couple of children's novels and you know, five or six picture books. And I, you know, she, I knew she was watching me, so I just wanted to act like I knew what I was doing. And that's why I'd come in. So I you know, picked up one of the picture books and started looking through it and picked up one of the novels and read the flap copy. And I acted like that had been my intent all along. Well, the woman who had been sitting at the desk got up and walked over to me and she said, oh, are you interested in coming to our book discussion? Well, I didn't realize these were the books that they were gonna be discussing um, that month. So I had to cover and I said, um, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> why so I'm here. Um, I was, I don't know why I couldn't just say, well, no, I'm just early for class and looking around, but I just felt like I had to make an excuse for being there. And so um, I, you know, suddenly realized, yeah, I actually was kind of interested in getting together with people to talk about these books. So a few minutes later, I was leaving that library with one of the books checked out overnight, and I learned that this library was called the Cooperative Children's Book Center. And um, the book that I had checked out to read, probably none of you have ever heard of, it was by David Curtian, and it was called It All Started with Old Man Bean. I took it home and I read it, enjoyed it. Hadn't read a children's book since I was a child, and in that moment, I rediscovered children's literature. It was like finding an old friend. I was hooked. So I read the book. That night, I returned it the next day. I checked out the second novel. And I took that home and um, started poring over the picture books. I attended my first CCBC book discussion a week or so later. And we were sitting around a large table. There were about eight people there. Um, and we were discussing the books. What a great thing to do. It was really fun. The group's leader, the facilitator, was the CCBC director, Ginny Moore Cruz. And I learned that she was chairing the Newberry Committee, which I had heard of. I'd even read Adam of the Road, um, you know, a number of Newberry books when I was a child. So I knew that. I was so impressed. I never had met a real person who was on the Newberry Committee. So um, I felt, you know, this is pretty important stuff, sitting around discussing these books. So um, everybody at the discussion was really, really welcoming to me. You know, they acted like they really cared what I said. Um, they, but they all clearly knew so much more about books, and yet they treated me as an equal. I later learned they were all staff members of the CCPC. And I thought they, mostly except for Ginny, I thought they had all wandered in off the street <laughs> like me and been like <clears throat> caught like a spider in a web come read the books. But I, I think that really speaks to um, the culture of that discussion, that I could be there for two hours discussing books and not realize they all knew each other. Um, they just made me feel like I was part of them. And um, they were really, really friendly and amiable until we got to my favorite book, the second novel that I had read. They just started to tear it to shreds right from the beginning. Um, I had been so eager to discuss it because I thought it was, you know, the best book I had ever read and I so wished I'd read it as a child. But there they were laughing about how bad it was and quoting awful lines from it and I just was sitting there feeling smaller and smaller. I felt so stupid because I had liked that book so much. And then I thought maybe this isn't for me, maybe I'm in the wrong place. I had even written a fan letter to the book's author. I just felt so embarrassed. And it was his first novel. And I thought, oh, what am I doing? I'm encouraging this poor man <laughs> to write another book. And he apparently is really, really bad at it. The chair of the Newberry Committee thinks so. And, and all these smart people think so. So it was, it was really um, awkward and uncomfortable, and I just sat there feeling dumb, and I didn't say anything, and we moved on to the next book. So um, I did go back the next month, though, 
because I had caught the book discussion bug and I also realized that um, I enjoyed reading children's literature. This time, the second discussion, they were discussing a book by one of my favorite childhood authors, Madeline Lingle. I had loved this book too. It was called Ring of Endless Light. And um, it was like rediscovering an old friend to read a new book by Madeline Lingle, kind of set in the, in the same, um, same universe as a Wrinkle in Time, although this was real. You know how all of her books are connected. I only uh, figured that out much later. But um, so I went, when I went to the discussion, the same thing happened again. These bright people, experts in the field, started just ripping this book to shreds. And, you know, again, I started feeling, you know, what is the matter with me? But this time I worked up the courage to say, well, I actually liked this book. And I want to tell you why. And everyone at the discussion got really quiet and they listened and it changed the tenor of the discussion after that. After I left that day, everyone who'd been at the discussion, all of these CCBC employees, had, I learned, they had sat down and talked about it, what had happened. And they, they felt awful because, you know, they realized they were ripping into these books and not really giving them a fair shake. So they agreed that going forward, they would begin each discussion, each discussion of a book, by allowing people who had appreciated the book to say something first. And um, as just a, a matter of postscript, I, I have to tell you, I felt really vindicated when A Ring of Endless Light went on to be a Newbery Honor book that year. <laughs> um, it was clear that I was not the only one who thought it was worth reading. And <clears throat> remember that first book that I didn't talk about where I had written a, a fan letter to the author and in the meantime, he wrote me back. Um, you know, this really lovely letter, drew little illustrations on it, and, and um, we started a correspondence. Um, that book was a novel called The Lightning Time, which you may or may not have ever heard of, but I'm sure you've heard of the author because it was the first novel of Gregory Maguire, who started out writing for children before he went on to uh, do a couple other things, and he still does write for children occasionally. but. I have this great letter from very young Gregory Maguire. I, and he told, when I met him later on, I, a few years later, he told me that had been his first fan letter. <laughs> that I, and he said he still remembered my handwriting. So um, I felt vindicated, but that vindication came much later. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I became a regular at the CCBC monthly book discussions. And in the meantime, I decided to go to library school after graduating so that I could spend the rest of my life reading, evaluating, and discussing children's books. So that's what I mean when I say book discussion changed my life. And I guess you could say that, uh, in a sense, I changed book discussion, at least at the CCBC, um, because I was able to speak up and go against the tide of what was being said in um, one particular discussion. Um, the librarians there developed these guidelines that you all had um, sent to you. Um, no, they're known as the CCBC discussion guidelines now. Um, and a few years later, when I became one of the librarians at the CCBC, um, Ginny and I refined these discussion guidelines based on our experiences with monthly book discussions. And in 1989, we wrote them down. And those are the guidelines that you have um, on the uh, ALA Connect that you saw. Maybe you have some of them you, that you have them with you. Um, we actually originally did that document in 89, I believe, for an ALSC Institute where Ginny and I talked about book discussion as a means of book evaluation. So um, we still use those guidelines today. We still have monthly discussions and occasionally we get a lost and uh, bewildered undergraduate who comes into our discussion and luckily doesn't have that experience I had of having people tear apart her favorite book. So what I want to do in my talk today is just kind of go over these guidelines and tell you a little bit about what lies underneath each point and um, how it's put into practice. Although these guidelines were developed for the CCBC's monthly book discussions, they can be used by anyone. They're currently used by ALSC award committees, um, but you can use them with children. 
I have a colleague who has used them successfully with first graders. Um, they work with any group who are talking about books. You've heard the story behind where the Make Positive Comments First guideline comes from. Um, and once this was put into place, we found that it had another positive effect beyond allowing a less certain or less experienced voice to emerge. It also kept the group from being polarized from the outset. Asking for positive comments first forces everyone to look for the good things in a book. And we always like to remind people that ev for every book that's published, it's a labor of love, it's a labor, a very hard labor, and that there are people who believe in that book, who, you know, there's the author, of course, believes in it, um, the author's mother, um, <laughs> and definitely, you know, if the author's agent, if the author has an agent, and most do now, the, the editor, the people in the publishing house, the art director, everybody, believes in that book to get it there. So they all see something good in that book. And the, you know, there's the case sometimes um, where I think you know, a, a first or second time author, you know, we always hear, they might get published, their first novel might get published because the, uh, the, the editor has real high hopes for their fifth novel, you know, to develop that author. So what is it that um, people are seeing in the book? So even if you read it and you don't appreciate it, you don't get it, um, if you think of it in those ways, what is there about this book that makes others believe so strongly about it? So um, there, the, this leads us to the first point under uh, the positive approach, and that is look for, at each book for what it is rather than what it is not. There's always a temptation when you finish a book that for you has fallen short to think about how the author could have done something differently to make it better. If only the author had changed what the mother did, or it would have been so much better from one of the secondary characters' points of view, or I think the illustrator should have done the illustrations in black and white instead of color. They would have been more effective that way. We've all thought things like this because we're critical readers. But no matter how brilliant or perceptive your rewrite might be, the author didn't make those choices. Furthermore, we have no way of knowing what, um, if the author considered and rejected those ideas. And when I say author, I also mean illustrator here, because we're, so, we're also talking about the pictures in picture books. Uh, we, we don't have to worry about that, because ultimately, it's the author or illustrator's work and uh, what they and their editors and art directors believe in as a form ready to go out into the world, we have only the book in front of us to consider, not the book that might have been. So we just try to keep from veering off into a discussion of what the book could have been. So what do you do with the book in front of you? First, we have to make the assumption that everyone participating in the discussion has read the book. If someone hasn't, they should sit back and listen and not hijack the discussion by asking questions about the book. Everyone who is participating in the discussion should think about what the author illustrator did well in the book. So this brings us to the first subpoint: make positive comments first, try to express what you like about a book and why. And that's really important. It's not just, well, I like, such and such character. It's why, what was it about that character? Um, and this is where true evaluation comes in. The positive negative discussion model can devolve into comments like, I really like the main character, or I like the illustrations. Okay, but why? We need to get beyond I liked, I didn't like mentality and try to articulate why. What was it about the main character that made her memorable? Was it the character development, the use of dialogue, how she talked, what she did that was surprising, and what specifically did you like about the illustrations? The use of color and line, the composition, the art style. The facilitator can always help people get beyond, I liked it, by prompting with questions like, can you say more about that? Or what specifically did you like and why? Or simply, because? 
And when there's something you don't like about a book, something you felt didn't work well, this is where we come in with the next point. After everyone has had an opportunity to say what they appreciated about the book, you may talk about difficulties that you had with a particular aspect of the book. Try to express difficulties as questions rather than declarative judgments on a book as a whole. For example, instead of saying, that would never happen, say, would Max's dinner really have still been warm? When that helps to open the discussion. You know, when you say these declarative statements, it can close it down. But when you can ask questions about what things you're, you're, um, that didn't work for you, it can help open the discussion. Even when books don't, we don't, with books we don't personally care for, and maybe especially with books we don't care for, we have to keep in mind that except for typos, nothing in a book ever happens accidentally. Everything in a book, every word committed to paper, every line drawn in an illustration, every dab of paint was put there intentionally and also vetted by critique groups, editors, art directors, copy editors, and the authors and illustrators themselves before the book ever gets to you. So your job in critiquing a book is to think about why those choices have been made rather than saying, oh my God, those illustrations were so garish and busy, they hurt my eyes, there's just too much going on in them. Try something like, I wonder why the illustrator chose to put those elaborate decorative frames around the pictures. I found them very distracting and wondered if anyone else figured out what the purpose was. This type of thinking allows for more open, free-flowing discussion rather than simply listing pros and cons. And it can be a much deeper, more interesting, and quite enlightening discussion. That, and that's what you want from good book discussion. Another pitfall to avoid is making a declaration that is impossible to prove or respond to. When people don't like a book they are discussing, and I've heard this so many times in book discussions and I don't want to hear it today at all, is when so, somebody will say, no kid would ever read this, or this would never fly at my library, or worse, this would be a real shelf sitter. Granted, you all have valuable experiences working with children and you may know their interests and tastes, but you can't always predict what an individual child or even a group of children will like or dislike. Sometimes, if you give them a chance, they will surprise you. I never would have predicted predicted, for example, that a group of struggling sixth grade boys, all African American and Latinx, would connect so deeply with Patrick Ness's monster call, a monster calls, and yet they did, so much so that they all jumped up and down, screaming and squealing with delight when they were later presented with their own hardcover copies of the book. They connected, and you know, this is a book I had had in book discussions with adults where they said, this book just be too hard for kids. They would never get it. These kids got it. And many of them were reading at um, well, well below grade level, some as low as second grade. So it's always made me cringe when I hear librarians make such declarations in discussions um, before a book has even had a chance to find an audience or before the audience has had a chance to find the book. Um, the, the, there's a, the other side to the coin. Oh, kids will love this. Um, again, you, you can't predict. And again, all kids, one kid, I mean, where, what is the, it's just better to talk about the book at hand rather than your predictions. And a few more basic etiquette points here. Um, when you're in a discussion, avoid recapping the story or book talking the book there's not time for a summary. Now remember, a book discussion is not a program. Everyone participating has read the book, so they don't need a summary of the book or a book talk. If you've ever conducted book discussions with children, you may have found them giving blow by blow of the plot. That's very common, um, and it's a hard habit to break them of. Um, but it can be done, I think, at first simply by saying something like, well, don't tell me everything that happened, just tell me one thing you really liked and why. Refrain from relating personal anecdotes. The discussion must focus on the book at hand. This is one of the 
I think, biggest bugaboos in book discussion. People who get off on a tangent talking about something from the book discussion that happened to them or someone they know. I like the book because it reminded me of my mom who grew up in the same area who used to do quilting, except her father wasn't a farmer. He worked as a cobbler in a little town. It was really similar to the one in the book. So the family in the book was really true to what people are like there, in my experience, of what I've heard from my father. Well, my fa her father's cobbler, my father's cobbler shop was uh, in business for over 75 years because his father, who I guess would be my grandfather, I never really knew him, he started the business. And all the people in my family were similar to the characters in this book, even though they didn't live on a farm. That really can derail a discussion for a number of reasons. Um, and you know that one thing can happen is um, someone else in the discussion can say, um, "Oh yeah, well you know cobblers they're just getting really hard to find these days." <laughs> um, but even if someone isn't going off following that tangent or that digression, what it does is it takes the discussion away from the book. And you, can't al you don't always have a comment about someone's personal life story. Usually book discussions have a very set time limit, and there's just not, also not time to hear everybody's personal anecdotes. I've gotten to a point where I really can't stand to be in book discussions where people are just talking about why they like a book because it relates to something in their life. Or, they use something in their life to say, oh, well, you know, that, well, that happened to my brother. So, um, you know, it is possible for somebody to actually jump six feet onto a cliff. Um, so things like that. Um, the friend I mentioned earlier who uses the CCBC guidelines with her first graders refers to those digressions with her children as at-home stories. And they are also not allowed to use at-home stories in book discussion. When someone shares personal anecdotes or at-home stories in a book discussion, there's really nothing others in the discussion can do except smile and nod or take that digression further, things you don't want to have happen. But what it ultimately does is take the focus away from the book. What you want in discussion is a level playing field so that everyone has an equal advantage. And refraining from veering off into personal anecdotes is one of the ways that we can do this. Another way is by here adhering to the next point, which is try to compare the book with others on the discussion list rather than other books by the same author or other books in your experience. This is an essential practice in award discussions because they're trying to find the best or the most distinguished book of the year not the best book in a series or the best book by Katherine Patterson. Um, we also adhere to this in our monthly book discussions because again, it helps create the level playing field. Everyone comes to a discussion with different backgrounds, different life experiences, different past reading experiences, different types of expertise, what they all have in common when they come to a discussion and they're sitting around the table is the books that are on the table up for discussion. Take the books we'll be discussing today, for example. Some of you come to the discussion having read the complete works of Steve Scheinken. Uh, for others, Undefeated will be the first book by him you've read. Undefeated must stand alone in the discussion. For our purposes, it's irrelevant how it compares to Bomb or Port Chicago 50. Similarly, we don't bring into the discussion other picture book versions of Three Billy Goats Gruff when discussing Jerry Pinckney's version because not everyone has seen all the other editions of Three Billy Goats Gruff. You may, however, compare it to After the Fall, Dan Santant's book about Humpty Dumpty since everyone else around the table will have read that. Sometimes it can make for very interesting discussions comparing books that don't seem to be alike at all. Um, and sometimes you can find interesting similarities or differences um, when you look at them in that way. And that's, you know, one of the things um, that happens in um, 
in award discussions in particularly in particular where you're discussing such different kinds of books and comparing one to another, you know, it's like the old apples to oranges type thing. Um, if you are in your just regular monthly book discussions or whenever you're doing book discussions, doing that, you know, trying for that comparison, that can really help lay the groundwork for um, future award discussions where you are having to discuss and compare books that may be very, very different from each other. Now, I wouldn't f force it, but oftentimes when you're thinking in that way, those things kind of um, come to the surface. Um, and then there, sometimes people try to get around this rule, um, and it, I wouldn't call it a rule, it's, it's a guideline, but you know, it's a form of discipline in a book discussion that um, adults can definitely adhere to, and so can um, children. Um, but there's another, this is another thing you hear a lot in discussions. I know I shouldn't say this, but if you find yourself starting a sentence this way, then don't. If you know you shouldn't say it, don't say it. It's as easy as that. It reminds me, my mother was a first grade teacher and it reminds me of um, something I witnessed her do when I was probably in junior high and it was open house night and a parent who was angry about one of the other kids in the class, not her own came up to my mother and said, I know this isn't the time to bring this up, but, and my mother said, then don't, and just <laughs> turned her back and walked away. <laughs> I was impressed with my, my, my badass first grade teacher mom in that moment. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, um, we all do bring different areas of knowledge and expertise to a discussion. Even if there are experts among us, everyone is an equal in a discussion and everyone's opinions matter. And that brings us to the second major point. All perspectives and vocabularies are correct. There's no right answer or single or correct response. We have no idea what anyone will say in the discussions um, that we'll be having this morning and this afternoon. And we're not looking for any particular points or observations. The people who chose the books for these lists we're choosing good, discussable books. They're not waiting till the person figures out that one thing and brings it up and then we'll check it up. Good, good. <laughs> no, we don't know what anyone's gonna say. And, and we're just looking forward to really good discussions. So it isn't a, it isn't a test. It isn't some kind of um, uh, thing you have to pass. It's just good discussion. In terms of vocabulary, we all come from different areas, and, and there are sometimes when a person in a discussion uses a specialized word you don't know. I once um, was listening to a radio interview that was done um, with Eliza Driesang. It was a call-in show. Um, I don't know, many of you probably know Eliza, or at least know her name. Um, she's a great expert on children's literature, and. Um, so she was talking in this call, on this call-in radio show about trends in children's books, and she kept using um, the word genre. And um, the first caller that called in said, what is genre? What do you mean by that term? And um, you know, I thought, what a, what a good question, because you just make the assumption people know what the term genre means, but outside of our field, not everybody knows that term. Um, so, it's, uh, it's fine that we all know different things. And sometimes, for example, there might be an artist, someone who has an art background, or um, someone who is a, a, a picture book artist or fine artist in the discussion, and they'll use terms you might not know. They might use a term like foreshortening. And if you don't know what that means, ask the person. Not only will it improve the discussion for everyone, but it will also add a word to your critical toolkit and maybe even help you see a picture through the artist's eye. Um, but by the same token, listen openly to what is said rather than who says it. There are sometimes people in a discussion will defer to it, the facilitator. Um, we, we have someone who comes regularly to our monthly discussion. I usually facilitate the monthly discussions, and she always looks at me <coughs> when she's um, talk, whenever she's talking about a book. 
even if you know she's responding to someone who's just said something, she always looks at me as facilitator and you know like what can I do as facilitator to get her to turn her head and look at other people? Is that you know I feel like I'm the teacher when she does that and I'm not I'm just a facilitator. Um, and also to be honest, in our female-dominated profession. I see many instances where there will be 11 smart women sitting around a table at a book discussion, and there will be one man in the group, and women know this, right? It's deeply ingrained in us to defer to the man, to, you know, if it's a book about boys, for example, anything. Um, just be aware of this dynamic and strive to listen to what is said rather than who says it. You may have an expert in your group, my own very first, um, ALS committee assignment um, was on the Notable Children's Book Committee. Um, and I found myself seated across the table from Zena Sutherland, who was also on the committee. Um, she was in many of these slides with Bill Morris. <laughs> um, she had written my children's literature textbook. And I had just graduated from library school, you know, three years before. And Zena Sutherland was a goddess to me. Um, and I couldn't believe. I was even in the same room with Zena Sutherland, let alone discussing books. How could I ever say anything that disagreed with Zena Sutherland? And yet, I found myself disagreeing a lot with what she said. <laughs> so um, initially, I felt really intimidated. But after a half hour or so, I was able to get past that feeling by focusing on what was being said rather than who was saying it. And I found we survived, even though I didn't always agree with Zena. She was wrong about some books, I will say. <laughs> the next point should go without saying. Respond to the comments of others rather than merely waiting for an opportunity to share your comments. Again, if you have ever done discussions with children, you'll know this is one of the trickiest things for them. A hand goes up and stays up until they've had a chance to say what they want to say. So like five other people can talk, and the child's still <laughs> raising his hand, wants to talk, really, really desperate to talk. And um, when you call on them, there are two things that can happen frequently. One is they've forgotten what they were going to say. Uh, the second is three other children have said the same thing uh, right before them. because They haven't been listening. I used to have a, a high school teacher who was originally from Poland, Mrs. Jigello. And she had this technique for us um, in, our, in our class. Um, I think I always thought of it as a European. She would call on someone, and they would say the, they would you know ain't respond, and then she'd call on someone else and say, "Did you hear what such and such said?" Yeah. What did such and such say? That that student had to repeat what they said, and if they didn't know, she would call on someone else. What did such and such say? And then go back to that. Second person she'd called on, did you hear that? What did they say? So we all really learned to listen to each other. Otherwise, you know, you might be a little embarrassed by letting your mind wander. But it, it worked really well. And I think she just had this talent for zeroing in on the kids who weren't really paying attention and bringing them back in. Um, and so with children, um, what this, I think, means is they're less skilled at the fine art of listening. Um, they will gain it from experience, hopefully. <laughs> With adults, active listening is a key component of book discussion. It's fine to go into a discussion with no idea of what you're going to say until you get there. Some people come to a discussion with all these notes. You know, that's a style. That's fine. Um, they have all these things written down. They're all prepared. And some people don't. And some people come in and they see the person with the notes and they think, oh my god, I'm ready for this. But no, you don't need to know what you're going to say when you come in. because And actually, I think sometimes discussions are better that way because you are actually responding to what you're hearing, uh, listening to the comments of others, taking them in, synthesizing, responding to what you've heard, asking questions. These are all key components of good discussion. Um, talk with each other rather than the discussion facilitator. As I mentioned this a little earlier, um, back to the children for a moment. This is a tough thing for them, and I think it's due to their school socialization, where they're used to talking to their teacher in a classroom discussion. 
it can be a challenge to get them to talk to each other. From my own experience um, in, a, in a public library setting, I've found it uh, helpful to include children from homeschool families um, in book discussions. There, this works out in a number of reasons. A lot of times, people who homeschool their children are really looking for other opportunities to them, for them to interact with their peers. Um, and, um, but the thing I love about having homeschool children is they don't teach, treat me, the facilitator, as a teacher. And they talk directly to each other and the, the public and, and Catholic school kids um, in these discussions that I've done, oh, what, you talking to me? Um, so, but they can model that behavior and, and that um, is a really good um, skill for children to develop. But many adults too, is the one I mentioned, will address their comments to the facilitator. Um, if you're actively listening to others in the discussion, it's natural to address them. If you're not responding to something specific, vary your eye contact, looking at other people in the group and not just the facilitator. Uh, next point, comment to the group as a whole rather to, than to someone seated next to you. Um, side conversations during group discussion are a particular pet peeve of mine. If you're sitting quietly um, next, or if you're talking quietly in a whisper, or maybe not even a whisper, to the person next to you while the discussion is ongoing, you're not only missing the group discussion, but you're taking the, pers the person next to you out of the discussion, and you're being rude and disrespectful to the group as a whole. Just don't do that. Resist the temptation. Like I resist the temptation in these cases to say, is there something you'd like to share with the class? Um, I usually just say, you know, we, one conversation, we're having one discussion here. That usually stops that. So that's the story behind the CCBC book discussion guidelines. They work for us. Uh, they work for, uh, with experienced book discussers. They work with novices, um, even if they're all in the same group. They even work with children. Those first graders I was telling you about, I want to give you a uh, close with a real life example of a discussion uh, with those first graders. This stems from the year I was first on Notables, <clears throat> the one that I mentioned earlier was Zena Sutherland, sitting across the table from me. Um, I wanted to see what my friend, uh, Margaret Jensen, the teacher, what her first graders thought of the books we were considering for Notables. I was curious to see what children thought of, of the books. So, um, they're mainly six-year-olds in the fall semester of first grade. And I didn't want to influence their opinions of the books, and neither did Margaret. So what we did was to place big, a few big boxes of the books in the classroom with the books uh, face out in the box. And they were just there for a month or so, and Margaret had told the children, you know, these were books for them to read during their free reading time. And um, she didn't tell them which ones to read or anything. So. A month or so later, I came in and I had a discussion with the children about what books they had read and, and uh, what they thought of them. Margaret didn't facilitate the discussion. She was on the sidelines watering plants, as I recall. She always had a lot of plants in her classroom. Um, she was listening, but not participating in the discussion. It was just me and the six-year-olds. One of the children, Alyssa, was acting as the facilitator. She was the child of the week that week, and um, that was one of her roles. She would have to greet guests to the room, and she would have to um, act as a discussion facilitator when they were having discussions. These were just ordinary first graders, but they had a great teacher. Um, a little girl named Marion held up a collection of illustrated children's songs and said to me quite vehemently, we like this book because it reminded us of songs we learned in daycare. So that will give you an idea of how young they were, a little nostalgic about daycare. <laughs> um, the discussion turned to a picture book by Joan Blos called Old Henry with illustrations by Stephen Gamel. The children liked the story a great deal and were eager to tell me why. It surprised me because it's kind of a quiet book about an old man who lived alone. Um, you know, the kind of book that in a discussion you might hear someone say, eh, kids wouldn't like this. Who wants to read about an old man living alone? But they were quite enthusiastic. All except David, who hung back until the positive comments had been made. David had his arms crossed like this. He said, 
I didn't like the graphics in this book. David, said Alyssa, I don't understand what you mean when you use the word graphics. Do you mean the pictures or the whole design of the book? David, I don't like the way he draws grass. It looks like, just looks like a bunch of scribbles. Jason countered, well, I think the artist was trying to show how messy his yard is. The scribbles make it look all messy. That's not what I mean, said David. Some of the grass is pink and some is orange and some is purple, and I've never seen grass that isn't green or brown. One time, said Jessica, my dad was painting the house and that's as far as Jessica got because Miss Jensen from across the room said, Jessica, is that an at-home story? <laughs> Jessica hung her head a bit and said, yes. She stopped and thought a minute and then she said, why do you think the artist made the grass pink and orange? These are six-year-olds and you know they're using these guidelines and again, as I say, they have a, a great teacher, these same kids stayed as a cohort with the same teacher through fourth grade. By the time they got to fourth grade, they had the most amazing discussions. There was one, I remember Margaret told me about where they were discussing, discussing the Wolves of Willoughby Chase by Joan Aiken. And Margaret used to lead these parent-child book discussions um, in the evenings where parents would be invited to read the book, children would. And one of the parents said about the book, well, I don't know about this book. I think those wolves are too scary for children. And this boy said to the mother, it wasn't his mother, but to someone else's mother, I think the wolves are a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> so that was how good these kids got at book discussion. And that same little boy who had the wolves as a metaphor, um, actually his career goal at that point was to be librarian of Congress. But. He instead is now a professor of Chinese history. <laughs> um, but I always loved that career goal in a, in a fourth grader. So this is all pretty high level discussion for six year olds. Um, actually, it's pretty high level for anyone. We should all strive to approach books and our discussions with these same levels of consideration, curiosity, and give and take as these six year olds. Most of all, I encourage you to be ready to learn from each other and to approach books and book discussion with an open heart and an open mind and see what happens. You may be surprised. Most of all, enjoy it. That's why we all entered this profession in the first place, to share our passion for reading and talking about children's books. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you know the time is. Perfect, okay. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've heard KT talk so many times, and I learn new things every time. Uh, we have a break. We have a break. You can get up and stretch and get some water, but be back by 9.15, because there's more fun to be had.